And just to give a bit of a recap from last week, we started a series called Messengers and Martyrs. Messengers and Martyrs, and we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at the mission of the church, right? The mission of the church is different than how we're called to live as believers. Because as believers, we're called to live holy lives, blameless lives. We're called to live for the glory of God. Those are things that God has designed us to do. That's how we're called to live. But as believers, we have a mission. As a church, we have a mission. And our mission is to take the message of reconciliation. Right? If you remember, what that means is you're taking the message that God has made a way for God and man to be reconciled. And so that, as believers, that's our mission. So we no longer view people as the hair color they have or the style of clothes that they wear or the things that they do. No, we view people as souls. People who are either reconciled to God or not reconciled to God. They're eternal souls. And so that's how we view people and we need to take them that mission. Well, tonight is going to be more of a workshop, more of an illustration and examples of what it looks like for people to take the message of reconciliation, to take that message to people who have not yet been reconciled to God. So we get to hear from some special guests tonight. So first we get to hear from Rory, who's going to share her time as doing a mission trip over in Africa. So she's going to share that with us. And then after that, we are going to have our leaders, Matt and Jessica Laster, they're going to come up and present. They were missionaries in Bulgaria for five years, so they were doing that. They were taking the message of reconciliation, and they were taking that to people who needed to hear that. So they're going to share about what it was like to be missionaries, what led to them being missionaries, things like that. And then we're going to open it up for questions. Maybe you guys have questions about what it's like to live on the mission field or how to prepare if you're feeling called to missions, things like that. And then we'll go to small groups and we'll get more into the, the nitty-gritty, the details of our own lives, how we prepare for things like that, what God, God has called us to, the obstacles, challenges, things like that. So does that all sound good? Yeah. Right on. So Rory, why don't you come on up? So you guys all be respectful, be smiley. Sometimes you guys look really intense, really serious. So be friendly, be supportive. And Rory, here's a microphone. There's your presentation. And the floor is yours. So we were in Kaibera, which is one of the slums in Nairobi, Kenya. And that's a picture of where we were mostly. Um, so Tundum was the foundation we were working with. Um, they have a band as well, and this was in their office in Kaibera, and then they also have a um, studio, music studio, outside of Kaibera. Um, so this is me and Safari after, we, um, were pra after they started practicing their songs, and he let me play his guitar, and we just kind of just like played a little bit, um, and my friend Keegan, he joined in on the drums after, like we kind of did that and it was really cool. Um, so Hope Church was the church that we were at for the two weeks we were there. And Safari is doing like a little teaching thing before the sermon actually started. And the sermon was like, tend to get like really crazy because they would like, in the middle of the sermon, they would sing a song and then they would go back to the sermon. And it was really cool because they would have you like dance and sing while in the middle of the sermon. Um, and before church had started, these girls we met, they were doing dances and they were teaching us how to do the dances. And then we taught them some uh, songs and dances from church, like Camp Compass songs. And that was really cool to like watch them learn it and then sing and dance with us. After church, um, we, I was playing with the little girl on the left, and we were teaching her like how to play different games. And then on the right, we were teaching them how to play down by the banks, and they enjoyed that. And then this is kind of like a youth group, but the boys and girls were together, and they didn't separate at the end. They kind of just stayed together and studied the Bible, and then um, one of the guys we were with, his name was Russ, he did a testimony, 
And it was really cool to see, like, the, guy, the people um, enjoy holding a physical Bible because we had gifted them Bibles. And they were, like, so excited to just hold a Bible in their hand because most of them hadn't been able to do that before. Um, these, the girl in the purple and the girl in the green are sisters. And on the first day, we got to visit them in their house in Kybera, and we got to talk to them about God and um, just like what they needed prayers with and how we could pray for them and help them. And by the end of the trip, we got to give them some money so the girl in purple could go to school and the girl in green could go to therapy for some things that happened in her past. Um, so the, fooding, the food drive that we did was like this, those were like, those, each bag was probably like 60 pounds. And it was just full of different kinds of food that would last the family, depending on how many kids they had, like a month to two months. And it, we took all day just putting together over like 100 of bag, bags of those for the people that came to a sermon in the back of the office. And then they had a financial group that taught them how to take care of their business and finances as well. So that was some of the food we gave them. And then this is one of the schools we went to. I personally did not go to this one, but my mom and Keegan's mom did. And this is the elementary, I think. And they um, sang songs with them. They told them about God. And then they gave testimonies. And the thing about these schools is all of them have God incorporated into it. And so they were really surprised to hear that the schools here in America don't. They were like, oh my gosh, you don't teach God? And it was like cool to see that they didn't know anything else other than that. Um, this is the group that we were with. Um, there's a lot of people. The guy on the closest here, that's Kefa. And then the, he's the leader of the band. And then the guy next to him is Keith. And then the girl next to the white lady or white guy is Nelly, and the one next to her is Kenny. And then there's also Safari in the back over there. Um, game day was also kind of like field day. And so we, the X cans, which were people that were either going out of high school and starting jobs or in college, um, we were playing games with them and we were teaching them how to um, use God in their life for the certain profession that they were going to do. So we had them separated into groups, and then we would talk about them, like how to pray, how to, um, I think it was, how to like do things financially through God, and some other lessons. And some of the games we played were really random, but they were really fun. So. Um, these were some people that we met. The guy in the bottom left corner was, that was during one of the music workshops that we did. Um, and all the kids were just super excited to see us. And they would like, everyone would do that to um, us. And they would just surround us and ask us questions and touch our skin because it was white. And they didn't, like, they never felt white skin before. And they would play with your hair. And the people on the right in the bottom corner, my mom and Keegan's mom went to that um, family specifically in Kybera and they prayed for that mom because she was a mom of five without a husband. She was really struggling and she didn't have a business but um, I think she was going to start one and so they were just talking to her about how to do that wisely so she wouldn't like um, not do good at it. And then Kybera kind of looked like that with like the slums and then the clothing in the bottom right, that was very common to see like racks upon racks of clothes just in one little like box of a building. And then there was like the fancy top right, that was more of the fancy kind of um, food places that you would find. They were mainly kind of run down and the food didn't look the greatest, but it was okay. <laughs> And then you often saw fixed, like, fish in like racks. And it was really crazy because the, the ladies that would be cooking the fish would reach into the boiling pot of water, just their bare hand, and pull out a fish and give it to you. And it was really interesting to see that because 
Like her hand didn't get burnt. It was interesting. Um, and then there were shoe shops everywhere that just had like shoes hanging down. I don't think I ever saw a pair of matching shoes, but <laughs> they were all together like that. And then those big trash piles were also everywhere. And the goats would eat out of the trash and they would just have like goats everywhere and then the people with their goats <laughs> and they would move from different spots. And then that's an overview picture of kind of where we were in the bottom left. And then on the safari, we saw um, those animals, which I thought would be nice to add in because they looked pretty cool. And then, yeah, that's it. All right, so Rory, a few questions for you. First thing, what would you say was your favorite animal that you saw on the safari? An elephant. The Those elephant. Definitely my favorite animal. It's pretty sweet. Um, okay, so then what would you say was like your overall highlight, favorite part of the trip that's gonna like stick with you the rest of your life? Um, these two girls that we met were just like really down and depressed. And they had like a lot of things going on in their life that was kind of unimaginable. It's mm -hmm. just like really horrible. Mm -hmm. um, by the end of the trip, this one girl, the one in the green that I showed you previously, she had a little bit of autism, but by the end we were at this big concert and she took my hand and she drug us to the top and she started singing and dancing with us, which she mm -hmm. was very non-verbal, non, like don't touch me at all before. And then by mm -hmm. the end she was like so happy just to be there with people and praising God and it was really cool to see that. Wow, yeah, no, that's special. And was she like around the same age as you guys or um, yeah, I think a little she's younger? 14, okay. What's her name? So we can be praying for Vanessa. Vanessa. So we can be praying for Vanessa. And then you said the band is tuned them. Yes. Okay. And it, then it means to, so it's a prayer to God for God to tune the people that they work through to him. Okay. Kind of like forget. the song come thou fount. Yeah. Okay. Tune our hearts to sing your praise. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, and then hope church, was that the name of the church? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, write those things down in your prayer notebooks. We can be praying for Vanessa for Tune Them, the band, and then Hope Church. Now, what does the band do specifically? Like, do they do concerts? What's, do They're you know? They're starting to do more concerts mm -hmm. every once in a while. They do music workshops, which is where um, the different band members talk okay. about how they use their talent for God's okay. um, will. Mm -hmm. And they also go to... They support people in Kybera who are struggling, specific families. Totally. And they just give them God's word, and they give them money every once in a while, but not very much of it. Okay. They just kind of give them guidance. Okay. So it's kind of like a witnessing opportunity through yeah. the band and stuff? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, so then, final question I have. Was there any crazy thing that you ate over there that you're like, whoa, I've never had that before? Yeah. <laughs> What'd you have? Well, we ate... The goat wasn't that bad. Okay, it was you had kinda, goat. It was interesting. Um, but there was interesting parts of the animal okay. that we ate that was right really on. <laughs> not the greatest. Fair enough. It's kind of gross. <laughs> Fair enough. Do you guys have any questions for Rory? Yeah, so in that country, they believe that if, well, it's kind of, common sense, but if they don't know English, they won't get anywhere in life because everyone knows English. And so I think there was one lady that we met that didn't know English and she was really old, so. Hmm. But everyone there knew English, it was really So cool. you're able to communicate with most of the kids? And yeah, they taught us some Swahili phrases. Can you say something for us? Nikopoa is I'm fine. Okay. Jumbo's hi. Hakuna Matata, you guys should know that one. There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And then there was um, Asante is thank you And Asante Sana is thank you very much That's all I can remember at the moment Hey, that's <laughs> impressive, that's awesome Taught us some Swahili uh, Any other questions? Yeah Islam is just So when the British took over like Africa They put all the black people In that one area And so it was just like shacks and it was like really horrible because it was just like tin boxes that people lived in and most of the time it was like families of eight um and then as they kind of, as the british kind of left the 
city just grew up around Kibera. That's one of the slums. There's a lot, though. So just very rundown areas. Yeah, it was kind of nasty right. to be in there. It's, it's sad. It's sad living conditions, for yeah. sure. But they were also joyful, which is really cool. Right. They have a lot of contentment, even though they don't have much. It's very humbling. I went to Africa once, and it was just humbling to see. Like, they have so little, but they're so thankful. And we come back here, and we complain all the time, and we have so much. And it's just it's a gut punch, for sure. There are all these different handshakes that you did for different kinds of people. OK, interesting. Yeah. One of them was very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> nice, right on. Yeah, we'll take a few more questions. Yeah. Um, yes, they're starting to do that. Um, they're starting to form organizations that do that. One of the guys, um, his name was John Tay. He was an ex-can, and he was starting a project to go and clean up the slums and just like help make them look better. There was a um, hotel called The Radix. We stayed there. It was like 15 minutes from Kibera, yeah. All right, last two questions we had, Lucy and then Daniel. She asked. Oh, cool, there you go, Daniel. No, they were extremely small. Most of the time, if you were lucky, you had a room to sleep in and a room to cook in. It was usually just this one little tiny, I think it was five by eight. Um, and it was like a little couch and maybe a table and they would sleep in there. It, it was horrible. And like this one poor lady, every time it rained, the, her mud wall would cave in. Mm -hmm. And so her house would flood with mud and she'd have to take like a bucket and dump it out. And so they reinforced it with plywood, but I don't think that'll work real well. Mm. So then to wrap up, because we're going to spend time this evening praying um, for a number of different things, but this is one of them, praying for the people that Rory went to help. So you mentioned a few things, Vanessa, and then the church band, um, and just the people. Anything else specifically that we can be praying for that as you're coming back, you're like, we need prayer for these things? Um, just that Tundum band will get more money coming in because they can't pay their people mm, and so okay. then they can't start doing like it's all volunteer work okay and so the people that are volunteering for them have really hard living conditions mm -hmm. so it makes it hard to so funding focus. for the band so that they can keep doing what they're doing taking yeah. the gospel out yeah. through music and stuff like that totally all right well thank you rory appreciate you sharing that with us All right, now we got Matt and Jessica Laster. So let's welcome them on up. All right, so here's one. And then here's a second one for you guys. First off, Rory, that was super good. We're going to have to stay on track because you did really good and didn't run off on any sentences and stayed on your slides real good and so we'll have to do that too um, and just super encouraged to see that you went out at such a young age to such a distant land because um, sometimes missionary work can be like you know kind of just down the street but you went way out there so that was cool to hear about um, well at first I want to introduce myself my name is Matt and this is my wife Jessica uh, we are the Lasters uh, we have three boys our oldest son is Levi, he's right over here, and uh, he was in Bulgaria the entire time we were there. Um, so, do you remember how old you were when we moved there? Seven? Okay, so, well, you know, close enough. But we were there for five years, yeah, so I mean, it was almost half his life. So, um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, he's got a lot of good stories, so if you want to ask him about them later, you're more than welcome to. I just know that you know, he um, probably didn't want to come up here and share with us, so we'll get to it. Um, so if you want to go on to the next slide for us, that'd be great. Um, we always ask people, do you know where Bulgaria is? And I know, yeah, nobody does. Everyone's like, Bolivia, Bulgaria, South America? No, uh, Bulgaria is Eastern Europe. So you can see over there on that map, that little red circle is circling it. 
It is southeast Europe, and it is as far uh, southeast as you can go before you hit the Middle East. It's like right there bordering Turkey. And so it's in a very old, old part of the world. Um, a lot of very close places um, that you would read about in the Bible are, are nearby over there. So it's got a lot of cool history. Is there anything that I need to kind of hit before we keep going? All right, we can go to the next slide. Um, Bulgaria um, is not very big. You know, I think driving across the entire country, I think it's gonna take what, like six to eight hours? depending on which way you go. And we lived right smack dab in the middle on the north side right there where that blue arrow is pointing to in a town called Troyon. Um, the picture of those people up there is kind of like, that's their, kind of like their folk kind of clothing. You know, like if we were to dress up like, you know, let's say Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, like that's their version of it, I guess. Um, nobody really dresses like that on the street, but when they have celebrations and stuff, that's what they dress up like. Um, and uh, it's kind of like that through a lot of Eastern Europe. Um, a lot of the cultures have very similar characteristics, styles, artwork, and, um, and food. Um, but it was just being, um, being there to kind of see some of that was really cool. Different styles of art. Um, okay. Say what? How much you get into the intro? Go for it. All right, Jessica's going to get into the intro for us. No, that's all you. That's me? You did the intro. Is it about the story, the play? Okay, so I'm gonna get into like why Bulgaria, because um, a lot of people kind of just think like, okay, like maybe you got assigned Bulgaria from your church and they told you guys where to go and you guys just were really good about, you know, um, being obedient and went. And that's not how it worked at all. Um, it actually all started for me when I was like in seventh grade. So if you're in seventh grade, raise your hand for me. All right, cool. So. You guys need to be preparing your hearts and your minds now because right now is a very pivotal point in your guys' life when God's going to probably start, you know, shaping and molding you um, into the man or woman of God that he's going to call you to be, and he has good plans for you. Um, they might not be to go, like, super far to a far-off country. It might just be to be, you know, a street evangelist or disciple here in America, but be preparing for it. Um, I was going to church in seventh grade, and um, the youth pastor that night um, got a bunch of little souvenir plates that looked just like that one. And uh, he said that the missionary family that our church was supporting um, had mailed those plates to us, and he had a bunch of them in the back on a plate or on a table. And um, he challenged all of us in the youth group. He said, hey, if you guys take one of those plates in the back from the missionary family we support, they said, uh, promise me that you're going to pray every day for one year for the city that's on your plate. Um, and I don't know why, but I like I took a plate and I realized like after I took it, like, wow, I really gave this guy my word that I was gonna pray every day for the city. So then I felt obligated to. And um, so I did, I started praying for this little city called Mount Shipka that's in Bulgaria somewhere. And uh, I prayed that God would bring missionaries there, that he would bring the gospel there, that there would be a revival. And you know, when you're praying every day for a year, you got a lot of things to pray about, you know? And so I was just thinking of everything I could. And um, that first year came and went. And for some reason, I felt like God was calling me to pray for a second year. And so I was like, fine, I'll agree to a second year praying for Bulgaria. And then in the second year, I realized like God was like, kind of like convicting me to go to Bulgaria instead of just praying to send somebody else and I was like, whoa, hold on, God. Like, I didn't even, like, look at where Bulgaria was on a map that whole first year I was praying for it. I had no intentions of going. I was interested in missions, but, like, not Bulgaria missions because that's real far. And um, so, anyways, I ended up, like, arguing with, with God in my prayers. And I was, like, asking God, like, you know, is this really from you? God, like, you know, I want to get married young. I want to have a young family. Um, How is that going to be possible if I end up being a missionary in Bulgaria? So I'm not saying to do this, but I kind of gave God a stipulation in my prayers. And I said, okay, God, I'll know that you want me to go to Bulgaria if you send me a wife that doesn't just want to go out on the mission field to any country, but a wife that specifically wants to go to Bulgaria like me. So I was like, okay, whew, that's my out. And that's my way to kind of get this calling off of my shoulders because I really felt like it was from God, but I didn't really um, you know, feel like I was capable of doing that. And so anyways, six years later, at a different church, I met a girl that had been to Bulgaria before. 
And so I asked her, hey, do you know where Shipka is? And she says, yeah, I know where Shipka is, but how do you know where Shipka is? And um, I said, well, I got this plate six years ago at this different church, and I've been praying for Bulgaria ever since. And she was like, really, you got a plate from that church? And I was like, yeah, why? And she said, well, I was with my mom in the gift shop when we were living in Bulgaria, and we bought those plates, and we were the family that mailed them to your church. And so I was like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> this, this is my wife, and I cannot tell her, because that's really weird, because I just, like, you know, started talking to her. And, um, yeah, so anyways, um, I knew at that moment, and we just had to awkwardly, I had to awkward, awkwardly befriend her, and we did end up um, getting engaged and getting married and stuff, um, and then I was able to share with her. Uh, but um, we did end up going, we went to Bulgaria, you know, um, but moving there and living there long term wasn't really quite on the table yet. Those, there were some things that God still had to do some work on my heart before he prepared us to do that, but um, that was just a story to let you know how Bulgaria ended up being the country that we would go to, and um, to just warn you, be praying or be careful how you pray because God is very much active and alive and answers prayers today just like he does in the Bible, but um, you got to just be making sure that you're praying consistently and being in a uh, really like diligent prayer life, and it's amazing to see what God can do for you and, and how he can answer your prayers. Am I skipping anything before we move on? Okay, we can go to the next slide. So this was uh, Jessica and I, after we were married, our first trip to Bulgaria. There's Levi right between us. It wasn't our first trip to Bulgaria, just first trip to Bulgaria with- Is yours, is yours on? Check, check, check. check. Yeah, it switches up. Check, 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 there it goes. We had been to Bulgaria before this, but this oh, was right. first right, time right. like married, taking our family at the time. That's little Levi. <laughs> and Jessica is pregnant with Jesse. You guys don't, well, maybe Jesse's out there running around somewhere. No, I'm pregnant. Yeah, with Jesse. Oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. Um, but behind us is kind of like an old style Bulgarian house. Um, the people don't really live in houses like that very much anymore, but we ended up living in a house like that when we moved there. It's kind of weird. Um, we can go to the next slide. All right. So um, to get to my story, my first time ever going to Bulgaria, I did end up making it to Shipka, but I had like 102 fever and I had strep throat, and so I couldn't get out and share the gospel with anybody. And so um, we ended up, you know, coming back from that. It was a short-term trip, and um, I was like, man, God, like, why would you get me all the way to Bulgaria and then not let me like share the gospel with anybody in Shipka? And I actually kind of think that like maybe God just knew my heart and he knew that if I got to share with like one person in Shipka that I would be like, check, okay, did that, finished my part of the deal, God, um, when God had much more um, thorough plans for me. And so we ended up, um, you know, getting married and I started a business and we had, you know, three beautiful boys and bought a house and we had everything going for me. And, um, and you know, one day I went to go unlock the door of my business when we were still living here and I felt God just like tell me like don't forget about Shipka and like I felt that like inside me but I swear I heard it and it was like so convicting and so um, you know like there I was sitting with like everything that God's part of the deal was but yet I didn't evangelize in Shipka and I was like man like what if I like die and I go to heaven and I'm face to face with God and he's like dude I gave you everything and like answered your prayers so clear and you didn't go do but like we agreed that you were going to go do and so I ended up selling my business and sold our house and um, we moved to Bulgaria when the boys were like little little dudes and our my youngest son's right there he's two and those like little trunks that are on that trailer there that's really like all we had to move with and um, we just like picked up and like moved our lives to Bulgaria. Um, you can do this. This one's yours. So this is just, uh, is it still working? No? Check? There Switch we go. the That's mic. A good idea. We can do that. I'll put it back here. One thing that we wanted to touch on here with these slides with missions is, I know with short-term missions, you wake up and you're just go, 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 go with ministry and busyness until you go to bed and you're living that 
like constant ministry. But when it's long term, it's definitely different. You're there for ministry. You're there for the gospel, but you still have day to day life, just like you do here. The boys had to do school. We grew food. You know, we had to do laundry. We had to just do life still. So long term missions does look different in a way than short term missions. So we just sort of wanted to mention that as well. You go to the next slide. Um, this was our cul-de-sac. This is the boys playing soccer with the neighborhood kids on the cul-de-sac. And um, one thing Matt didn't mention is one, like, our um, acronym, acronym the, the, what we felt God putting on our hearts to go and do there um, was we was to love, evangelize, and disciple. So our motto was led to Bulgaria. Um, and so part of this was just loving on the locals. We um, tried to create relationships with as many people as we could. And when you're on living on the mission field, your life is like a fishbowl. Everybody knows that you are not supposed to be there and you're still there for some reason and they are watching you and they want to know why you're there, which even that is just a huge opportunity to share the gospel. People stopped us at the grocery store. People stopped us everywhere. Like, what are you doing here? Because they are doing everything they can to get to America. And so for an American to be moving and living there, they're like baffled by it. So it was definitely an opportunity for us to share the gospel everywhere we went. So that was one thing that we were really trying to do is to just pour into the locals and um, build relationships. <clears throat> build relationships in that way. So this is one way, just kind of hanging out with the neighborhood kids. And um, that house that you see at the end, like to the left, it's hiding behind the tree. That is our dear neighbor. Her name was Baba Danka. And she became, Baba stands for grandma. She became our grandma. She fed us. She cared for us. She made socks for the boys. Like she was the best. So. And the next slide. Again, part of just like living and loving on the locals. This is Baba Danka there in the picture on the right. We were sitting, sitting at the end of the cul-de-sac and she was teaching me how to can our vegetables. So that big pot that's burning there, that's where we canned all the vegetables. Um, and then the other picture is my good friend helping us with our garden because I couldn't do it on my own. Um, another way, just kind of getting to know the locals. So on the left, this was Memorial Day. We went up hiking with some friends, and this was how you barbecue. Um, we just kind of, you heat up some charcoals on the ground, and you have a little, like, I don't know, like a grill thing. Basket that holds your hamburgers. And you put it all in there, and you cook it, and then you have a big feast together. And it's awesome. Really good food, too. Um, so this gets into part of, um, we're skipping evangelism for a minute and going kind of discipleship. So uh, we um, did not go there to church plant. That was never our goal or mission. Um, Bulgaria, a lot of the Eastern European countries really have a hard time with people coming in to the churches and feeling like they're stealing their sheep. So if you go and you plant a church in the same neighborhood, a lot of the people just jump from one church to the next, and then you're really burning relationships with the pastors there. And because we had done some research and I had lived in the country when I was in high school, we knew a lot of these things. And there are good churches in Bulgaria, but they lacked tools to really be able to build up the people within the church. So our goal was to come alongside the churches that were there to help um, train the leaders to build up the um, people in their congregation. So very similar to like part, the partners program that they have here, we, um, the foundation that we were with established a discipleship program that we went and um, worked with a bunch of different churches throughout. That's why we're located in the center because we would actually travel to different churches throughout the region and do the discipleship programs and teach the leaders to be able to replicate it and do it um, on their own. So, so, so that was starting with 
very beginning. This discipleship is starting at the very beginning. In addition to that, we did VBS. Every year we would do VBS um, with the kids at the local church um, that we were working with. So this is um, a picture from that. And one way, so we were kind of talking about ways that you guys um, can even kind of have your hand in mission now, missions now. This VBS, we talked about the superheroes of the Bible. And so everybody got a little cape, and those capes were sewn by people at our church in Amer in California, and they had sent those over for us. So if you guys hear of a missions team going out, you know, ask them if there's a way that you can help out, or if there's cards that you can write to the kids, or if there's capes that can be made for their VBS, something like that is a way that you can kind of get your hand in missions right now. Um, next slide. Just more pictures from VBS. You can go to the next one. Children's ministry. This was the children's ministry at the local church that we were working with. Um, and you can see it's not huge, especially compared to um, Compass, right? That was all age groups. <laughs> that was all age groups, except a couple of little babies. Um, but and with missions, you have to remember that number, it's not about numbers, too. It's about the people that you are pouring into. You might have just one or two people that you're ministering to the whole time, but if that's what God has you there for, then that, just that seed that you are planting is worth it and is amazing. You can go to the next. Um, I love this picture. So this is me and three of the um, children's ministry workers. And this was our very last VBS that we did before we moved. So we did one every summer. And the very first one we came in, we brought all the supplies from America. We brought the curriculum. We ran it all and they helped. And then slowly by the end, they did the whole thing, planned it all, got all the supplies. And I just kind of was there to watch. And so it was amazing because our goal was to train them and to build it, them up so that way when we left, because we knew we weren't going to be there forever, so that way when we left, they were able to continue the work. Um, we will get into the evangelism of Shipka in just a minute, but um, you know, when I wasn't in, evan uh, in Shipka evangelizing, we were working with these other churches to help um, start discipleship programs, and this was a fathers and sons um, group that we had started. And it was just, again, like trying to encourage the dads to be a part of the discipleship and the raising up of their boys. Because sometimes um, children's ministry, even here in the States, can kind of be taken over by the women a lot. And in Bulgaria especially, the dudes were like, all right, give me my boy back when he was like 17 and I'll t teach him how to play soccer or something, you know. And that was kind of like almost like the mentality of some of the fathers there. And so I wanted to kind of like redirect their focus into understanding that us as men are the priests of our home, that we need to be taking our uh, leadership at home for the spiritual goodness of our families and our boys um, into our own hands. And so um, that was just one of the groups that we had started uh, for the fathers and sons. You can go to the next slide. Um, this was the, the discipleship curriculum um, that we taught uh, different churches. So we would go to different areas and we would spend like um, weeks working with the people um, to go through it. Again, this was like uh, Compass's version of like partners but we had to translate it into Bulgarian and in both masculine and feminine tense because their languages were different um, for both of them. And uh, so we would just do intensive uh, workshops with these guys. The guy sitting to my left in that picture, he is the pastor of uh, this specific church. It was probably about like um, three hours away from our hometown. And um, the guys that were there were some of the more dependable men in his church that he wanted to, to have take through this curriculum also. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, here's another church, uh, centrally located church that we took these men through, and it was really funny. This specific church I got to share on Sunday, and I told them about this discipleship program, and then once I was done teaching, the pastor came up, and he was like, shut the doors in the back, and like none of the guys were able to leave after Sunday service, and he was like, all of you guys were going through this together, you know, and so they were like, okay, I guess so, you know, and so these guys, I think it was voluntary, or the pastor made, made them do it, um, but regardless, they were all taken through the program and uh, helped to understand some of those basic principles of, of the gospel. And um, what's really good for 
uh, these churches to do this for is because in B Bulgaria, like the the distance in biblical knowledge from the pastor to the, the the congregants was like crazy huge. Like the pastors really didn't have anybody to help them. There's no associate pastors. A lot of the times the pastors are also the ones doing worship. Um, and so they didn't really quite have those tools to be able to go, okay, like I can now trust that this person understands these foundational components of the gospel. So then that way they can replicate this discipleship with somebody else and start building up other leaders in the church. So they were really uh, appreciative of us going there and doing that with them. So go to the next slide, please. Here's another one um, that was at our local church. And again, like Jessica was saying, it was not about numbers. We were just looking at it going, kind of going like, these guys are going to also be seed planters. These guys are also gonna be waterers, right? We might go there and have one conversion or disciple one person, but God is gonna use that to, to replicate. And we have to trust that God's more powerful than we are, and he's going to take the, the laborers that are few and impact many. So next slide, please. Uh, I'll, I'll let you talk about this one. Um, so we also did youth camps yearly. Um, we worked with the local churches to do like a regular youth ministry. And so in the summer we would host a big, well, not, not big for Bulgaria, but um, a big youth camp. And there were times where our sending church in California would send short-term teams out. So this is kind of a mix. There's a handful of some Americans that came on a short-term team and then some of the youth that um, came to the camp. This was kind of at the end, we did a hike. Um, but one thing I do want to mention here too, like if you guys do ever, this just reminds me, if you guys do ever go on a short-term trip, it is amazing, and God can totally work in your lives, but I want to encourage you that your witness continues even after you come back to the States, because most of the time, those kids in the, that country might be following you on social media. Even if it's a very poor country, they probably have phones or access to internet, and they'll be following you on social media, and um, that your witness still continues. So I want to encourage you guys in that, too. Um, next, I don't know why Matt put this slide in here. Uh, Rory might know about this. There's this thing called time change, so um, I thought it was just funny to put this picture in there because this was us picking up everybody uh, from the airport, and for them it's probably like three o'clock in the morning. So just be prepared for jet lag. Um, this was still this another year. This was the um, youth camp that we did in the group photo. Oh, this I wanted to say that um, just letting you guys know that like if you guys ever want to go out on the mission field um, like there are resources like there's way more people that are willing to like give you money so that way you can go out on the mission field than there are actual laborers so if you're ever feeling like hey I want to go but I don't know how get in touch with people who have been missionaries or talk to my wife because she's really good about doing the more administrative kind of stuff to get a missionary out on the mission field legally and successfully. Um, but this was a picture of all of the, the Bibles that had got sent uh, to us to distribute for um, local churches or for evangelism purposes. And it just kind of goes to show you that there are funds for missions. There are funds to sh spread the gospel where we are lacking is laborers. And so if this is something that like you're considering or that you're praying about, um, just know that th there are resources that can help you get out there. It's not like uh, totally impossible, but there are steps that you need to go uh, into taking with finding those people that are gonna help be your sending team to, to launch you out there. Um, so I just put this picture up to kind of help remind me that um, the resources are there, the Bibles are there, the money's there, but the laborers are few. Go ahead, next slide. Um, this was a picture I wanted to show you like of me teaching. I did always have to have a translator because I'd never learned Bulgarian fully enough to be able to like teach on spiritual topics. Um, so I always had a translator, but I also wanted to show you guys um, that like for me, I was like really like blessed to be able to teach. It took years of being um, trusted within the congregations or the local churches. Um, they, they watch you for a while. Who is this person? What does he believe? Is he going to say something that we're going to have to like kind of clean up later? Um, so just know that if you guys go out onto the mission field or, or let's say you move onto the mission field, um, slow growth is okay. Slow growth means they're, they're watching you. Slow growth means, um, you're, you're getting in, uh, their, 
their trust zone. Um, in Bulgaria, there was a lot of times where missionaries would come and um, maybe they didn't know what denomination they were or they didn't know their purpose in going and people would be kind of taken advantage of. And so a lot of the times in Bulgaria, the walls were up and it was like very hard to kind of um, have opportunity to do ministry. And so I was very blessed to be able to have the, the, the trust to, to be able to teach. And honestly, I think a lot of it came from Jessica's family, like I said in the beginning, how they were actually there um, for many years before we went. Um, so we were able to go and falling under the umbrella of trust that her parents had established. And her parents went out there like in 1990, like after communism had just ended. And so they had been working help build these churches kind of like from the ground up because communism did end up having a devastating effect on that country, especially within their church. I think one thing to say with it, like taking time is just as a, you can hold it for just quick. As Americans, we want responses right away, right? That's what we're used to. And if we don't get that response, we're out of there. So if you guys do ever end up on the mission field, just know it takes time and trust that God has a plan and to just be patient with that plan and not just run as soon as you don't get that response that you were hoping for right away. True, true. Uh, this is Shipka. That was that little monument that was on that plate that I prayed for. So it was pretty surreal when I actually like got to the country and got to see that monument. Um, and then there's our three boys there uh, sitting at the, the, the steps. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, that'll be um, Nikki and I. That's uh, my good friend and the pastor of the Troyon Church that we were uh, living right next to. And uh, that is the town of Shipka as we would drive in to go evangelize. So above it, you'll see that those are actually like the Cyrillic letters, the Bulgarian letters. So that W is actually a SH, the backwards N is an E, that weird thing is a P, and then KA, so that says Shipka. Um, and so we would go um, door to door and let everybody know um, Matthew 7. And I came up with kind of like this uh, evangelism technique with bringing up Matthew chapter 7 for them um, because Bulgaria um, is an Orthodox country. So just like Mexico is like a Catholic country, um, they very much so identify as Christians. But um, I would take people through uh, Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says that many are going to come to him on their last day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And that word uh, know you or knew you is a, a word, um, I think it's a Greek word, it's gnosko, and it's um, to have like a rich relationship with somebody. So it's not just like, oh, I know the president of the United States. No, it's like, I know my wife, you know, like she knows me, I know her. Like it's not, I know of that person, right? So I think a lot of people in B Bulgaria knew of Jesus, just like a lot of people in America know of Jesus, but do they really know who he is? And so I would go there with an actual like Orthodox Bible and kind of show them that, hey, like this is your faith that you claim to have, but do you know who Christ is? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Is he your savior or is he just someone who you, who you know of? And so it was kind of a, a a difficult message to give somebody who identified so strongly with their their culture. It's kind of like Americans being patriotic, um, but you're then reminding them that hey, listen, like this is not just your your nationality. This is between you and God. And if you don't have like that real relationship with Him and that real covering of His sacrifice, then you're gonna show up thinking that you're getting into heaven with like an empty hand. You're not gonna have that ticket of salvation. And um, so if you can think of this like it's not very like pleasant to share that information with somebody when they're kind of like starting to question their own salvation but ultimately what we're called to do is plant those seeds sow truth um, in love and, and try to make sure that people understand the entirety of the gospel um, for as long as the amount of time that they'll let you talk to them and so it did take a while for us to get through that whole town but um, we did get to pretty much go through the entire town and everybody who answered their door and was willing to talk to us, um, I was able to, to give the gospel to. Um, and then this is, these are Jessica's friends. I'll let her kind of share. Uh, we're coming up to the end of the slideshow here, but she wanted to share some of the persecutions and struggles um, that her friends had gone through. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention, because I know like part of this kind of mini series, we're talking about like persecuted church. And I think sometimes when we think of persecuted church, we think like, 
you know, the people who can't physically go to church or they have to hide their Bibles. Um, but it does take place everywhere, even in a country where they are free to worship the Lord now. These are my good friends. On the left is Mila, um, and on the right is Benny. And Benny has been one of my best friends since I was in high school. Um, and both of them believed in the Lord. They went to a, a Christian church camp and um, became Christians. And Mila on the right, she was actually kicked out of her home because of it. And her, um, during the communist time, they weren't able to freely worship Christ. And her grandpa was actually one of the chief captains who went and hunted down the, <clears throat> sorry, her, her story brings me to tears because he went and hunted down the Christians. And so when she went home to her parents and said that um, she was a believer and believed in the Lord, they kicked her out of her house. And um, she trusted the Lord. And even though she was just a brand new baby Christian, she believed that he would um, guide her through that. And he did. She found people in the church who took her in and cared for her. And um, eventually her parents did let her back in. They still are not believers, but she was their only child. So they kind of went through this like, they missed her, really. And I'm sure God is working in their hearts. They still are not believers, but she is still a witness to them. And um, she's just an awesome, awesome believer. Um, and then Benny has a very similar story. She was not kicked out of her house, but her parents would not let her go to church at all. She would come to church, and um, they would come and take her out of church, like physically take her out of church. And so when I was there in high school, we were doing, um, like, English camps, and so we would do English Bible studies at our apartment. And um, we, my parents built a relationship with her parents. And so again, it's about building those relationships. And because they invited her parents over to dinner, they built a trust with us. And so they said, okay, she can't go to church, but she can come to your house because we know you, we trust you. We don't believe what you believe, but you know, we'll let her come to your house. And so she was able to come to the Bible studies because of that. Um, so just finding those ways to work with the locals, and a lot of times they, they won't be comfortable going to church. That's a big step for them. But even your friends here in America, maybe they are not comfortable going to church, but you can invite them to youth group because it feels a little bit different too. Um, yeah, so persecution happens daily, and it happens everywhere. I think that was, do we have more? Um, you want to finish it? Yeah. And uh, th this is our last slide, but this is our uh, like closest group of friends that we had um, ended up growing together with and serving with while we were in Bulgaria. And we just wanted to kind of finish out this slide to just let us be reminded, just even ourselves. Um, and I'm sure Rory's probably got to, you know, remember this too, but like that those people are still there. Those people still exist, you know, and it's very easy to kind of get caught back up in our life here in America and kind of forget about what, what was going on in Bulgaria. But ultimately, like, we want to make sure that we know that these lives that we're going out there to, to, to share with um, and, and plant seeds, that those still exist. They're out there and they need to be prayed, uh, prayed over and prayed for, knowing that, um, that God is still going to be using the work that you did to continue to replicate and further his kingdom. And so it was just really neat because one of these guys is the pastor of the church, one of the, them is one of the elders of the church, and that's actually Jessica's parents sitting over there too with, uh, with our kids. And so there's just this generation of, of effort to continue furthering the gospel in Bulgaria. Um, so just know that um, if you're doing something small, you know, it, it can definitely snowball into something big. Like I don't think Jessica's parents ever thought that like her like those plates that they sent to that youth group would end up finding a husband for her and having her husband then desire to move out to Bulgaria for another five years and go evangelize through the country. You know, so just know that um, God will put things in your path um, to do like wild, weird, amazing things. And you have to just be praying through them and trusting um, that what God is going to call you to do, um, he will provide for, he will protect you, and he will give you the doors and capabilities like uh, to get those things done. Because like to get to Bulgaria is actually like really hard. Um, 
but he opened the doors for us and, and let it happen and got us home safely. So we just wanted to praise God for that and being able to go and do the ministry that we did. And uh, we wanted to just thank Johnny for giving us the opportunity to share about it. And if you guys have you know time in your prayer life to be praying for those people that I evangelized to in Shipka, that would be really cool. Um, and uh, that's it. Well, thank you, Lasters. That was awesome. That was great to hear how the Lord is working in Bulgaria and how he worked through you guys. Um, for sake of time, I think we'll save questions for next time. But what I wanted to do is if you guys could write down on your note sheets, if you have any questions for the Lasters, we will make time um, either next week or the week after that for you guys to ask your questions and they can answer any of those things. But this will also give you guys some time to chew on this and think, you know, maybe the Lord's calling you to the mission field. Maybe there's a place on your heart that you've been praying about. And so maybe you have specific questions as you're thinking through that. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to go to small groups. We're going to talk about some of the obstacles and barriers that we face to sharing the gospel. How do we fight those? How do we prepare well? Um, but then we're going to spend some time praying. We can be praying for the things Rory shared, for what the Laster shared. Last week, we watched that video about SOS Ministries. That's missionaries that we support in Uganda. They're training pastors. They have a school reaching out to kids your age. They have a church, so we can be praying for them. We can be praying for our missionaries, the Demos, in Albania. Well, they're not currently in Albania. They're here in the States because... Uh, Eddie Demo, his wife, Bona, she just had a kidney transplant, so she's been recovering from that, and they're getting ready to go back over there to train pastors and plant churches. Uh, and their son is getting ready to come to college here in the States, and so their family is going to be apart, which is going to be hard for them. So even just praying for their son, who's lived his whole life in Albania, so making the transition to the United States can be a challenge. So we can pray for those things. Your leaders have a list of that, and then praying for the persecuted church as well. So with that, we're going to... I'm going to close this in prayer here, and then we're going to go to small groups, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for saving us, for helping us to see our sin and helping us to see a need for a Savior and for giving us Christ. Lord, we thank you for putting people in our lives who were faithful to your call to share the gospel with us so that we could know the truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful to that same call to go and share the gospel with others. And Lord, for anyone here who may be feeling the, the tug for missions in a global sense, taking the gospel to people who may have never heard it before, Lord, I pray that you would just continue cultivating that, that you'd help all of us to take this seriously, um, that we'd be faithful servants of you in proclaiming the wonderful news that you have sent your son so that we could be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name, amen.